Welcome back to Dave Knows, the channel where I like to share all the things that I know. And today's topic will be... What? Again? Oh, I didn't want to do this the last time and I definitely don't want to do this now, alright? Okay, one of the launch videos for this channel was about the Montreal Screwjob, but I really just used it as a foray to talk about a hypothetical main event at WrestleMania between Austin and Bret Hart. However, even so, people still managed to bombard the comment section with angry defenses for the Screwjob, even though that really just missed the entire point of the video itself. So after all that, I really don't want to go down this path again, okay? Alright, fine, but this is the last time, because today, yet again, Dave knows the Montreal screw job. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar, the Montreal Screwjob happened at Survivor Series in 1997 in Montreal, Canada. Bret Hart, who was leaving the WWF for WCW, was the WWF champion at the time. He was told by Vince McMahon that his Survivor Series main event title match would end by DQ. But instead, Vince McMahon had the bell ring while Bret was in a submission hold as if Bret Hart lost, even though he never actually submitted, therefore costing Bret the title. And I have made it very clear that I am very much against the Montreal Screwjob. However, there has been a small, yet still surprising amount of backlash by Screwjob apologists. And in the past year, I've noticed several reoccurring arguments showing up. So this video is going to lay it out once and for all. My thoughts on why the Montreal Screwjob was bad. And before I begin, I just want to remind everyone that this is wrestling, and wrestling is filled with misdirection and inaccuracies. One person will give an interview stating one thing, while someone else will give an interview stating the complete opposite. And sometimes, even the same person can give contradictory interviews. And the Montreal Screwjob is no different, and in many ways, it's more guilty of this phenomenon than a lot of other wrestling stories that are out there. So if you hear anything that goes against something you heard or read, just know that that counts as hearsay, which is not empirical fact-based evidence. And also, there are probably countless other stories out there that do go against exactly what you heard. So just keep that in mind. But with that being said, a lot of my reasoning can be proven by actual dates and documented material like the documentary Wrestling With Shadows. Unlike hearsay, these do hold more weight as actual fact-based proof. So while yes, my thoughts on the morality of the Montreal Screwjob still has a lot of opinion behind it, just know that there are provable facts to back a lot of it up as well. Now let's get into things. As stated earlier, there are several repeating arguments that have popped up in my comment sections for the previous video since I began this channel. So allow me to get into those arguments now. One of the spins that the WWE has put on things over the past several years is that the Screwjob gave birth to the Attitude Era. Problem is, this is not factual, i.e. provable by scientific evidence. Yes, the WWE has claimed, along with others, that the Screwjob was the beginning of the Attitude Era, but WWE and others have also noted Stone Cold Steve Austin's coronation speech at the King of the Ring as the start of the Attitude Era, as well as Vince McMahon's segment, Cure for the Common Show. The problem is that the Attitude Era is not a real thing, it's just a term people made up to denote a period of time in the WWF. But there is no clear distinct time frame for this. As a result, people are free to define it however they choose. Now the Screwjob is a fair and logical starting point, but there is a lot to suggest that it started earlier as well as a lot to suggest that it started later too. There's no one definite answer. And either way, that doesn't mean that the Screwjob was actually good for business. The success of the WWF that followed is not directly connected to the events of the Screwjob. Job. Some believe that Vince McMahon's heel character, who was a major part of the Attitude Era, was created off of the backlash that he got from the Montreal Screwjob. Well, I doubt that to be 100% accurate. And here's why. There are several things to note about the birth of the Mr. McMahon character. First, Vince McMahon originally wanted to become a professional wrestler himself, but his father didn't want him to do it. The character that Vincent Kennedy McMahon wanted to play was originally the Million Dollar Man. But after his father urged him not to wrestle, he gave the gimmick to Ted DiBiase instead. The Mr. McMahon character character was an updated version of Vince's original concept. But that's not all. The next piece of evidence comes from the fact that Eric Bischoff was already playing the part of the heel authority figure in WCW with the NWO before the screwjob ever even happened. This was just another case of WWF trying to copy the success of WCW at the time. The Nation of Domination and DX were both attempts by the WWF to try and copy the NWO. The Mr. McMahon character was just another example of this. Since in the end WWE won the war, it's not surprising that they don't bring this up too much. Which is an important point in and of itself. A lot of younger people out there don't realize that history is written by the winners, and a lot of testimony out there has been given by the WWE itself, which already makes it a very biased opinion and not necessarily indicative of the truth. 
Now back to the Mr. McMahon character. People should also know that there were several months in between the screw job and Mr. McMahon as the heel authority figure. The Austin McMahon feud didn't really begin until after Austin won the belt at WrestleMania. So Vince using his momentum is a little inaccurate because he waited such a long time to do so. Sure, it may have contributed to a small degree, but there were so many other factors that show that the character probably would have just happened anyway. Furthermore, the sad truth that many people don't want to admit to is that not every Attitude Era fan knew about the Montreal Screwjob. Yes, many did know, and yes, WWF did talk about it on air, but back then, WWF didn't really break kayfabe all that often, and many people didn't know that this wasn't just another angle. And the internet was not as prevalent as it is now, and there were many casual fans who didn't see Survivor Series or the following Raws afterwards. In fact, many of the fans that gave WWF their up and coming popularity were casual fans who jumped onto the bandwagon and weren't watching at the time of the screw job. A lot of these fans began watching in 1998. That's why the ratings went up, due to new fans. So McMahon using his heat from fans to garnish success doesn't make a lot of sense because that requires that the audience be there in the first place, which they weren't. The success came later as a result of WWF cultivating brand new fans and bringing old ones back. But how did this happen? Well, that brings me to another point. Stone Cold Steve Austin. Now, I tend to get similar arguments to this from Vince Russo supporters. Some say that the screw job was good for business, much in the same way that people say Vince Russo was also good for business. My biggest problem with this is, what about Stone Cold Steve Austin? The man is arguably the biggest money draw in wrestling history. Now, the McMahons tend to ignore the importance that stars have on the industry. Bret Hart, CM Punk, Hulk Hogan, Stone Cold Steve Austin. Sure, the company survived without them, but it's undeniable that their popularity benefited the company in their success. Austin's stock was already on the rise, which is what led to the double turn at WrestleMania 13 with Bret. Austin's attitude was already catching on with crowds, making him the new top face of the company. People prefer Austin's more in-your-face persona, and this is what actually began the new attitude in the WWF and led to them regaining the top spot in the wrestling industry, which you can actually see by just looking at the ratings, because it wasn't until after Austin won the title that the WWF began reclaiming its dominance. The point is, give Austin credit where credit is due. Oh, and also, this angry Austin character came from ECW, and ECW was yet another influence to the Attitude Era that wasn't the Montreal Screwjob. Oh, and while we're on the subject, I know the internet tends to partisan everything, believing that you were either 100% for something or 100% against something, with no room in between. I'm sorry, but that's just not how I roll. I think you can dislike parts of something and still like it overall. I think humans are capable of more complex thought than just simply turning everything into a black or white scenario. So I don't agree with all those who act like just because I despise the Montreal Screwjob that it means that I am some sort of attitude error traitor. Alright, so now on to the next big argument that I get. Vince McMahon was right to screw Brett because Brett didn't want to drop the belt in Canada. Now a lot of my reasons for not agreeing with this point comes from what was shown in the documentary Wrestling With Shadows, which documented Brett's life around the time of the Screwjob. And since this is a third party doing the documenting, I do feel that it's a fairly reliable source. First part is the fact that Brett had creative control in his contract when it came to dealing with his exit from the company. And as such, Vince McMahon was in huge violation of contract by doing the Montreal Screwjob, and legally speaking alone, Vince is definitely in the wrong. But that should come as no surprise, because this isn't the only thing in the Screwjob that went against the contract. Because remember, WCW offered Brett a multi-million dollar deal to jump over. Brett declined this offer originally in order to stay loyal to the WWF. Vince McMahon then responded, knowing that he couldn't compete with the upfront value of WCW's contract, by offering Brett an unprecedented dented long-term contract to reciprocate Brett's loyalty. Brett's new contract would be for 20 years to show that McMahon was just as committed to Hart as he was to them. Now obviously this didn't end up sticking because this new contract was still paying Brett a lot of money, even if it wasn't at WCW's level. As a result, Vince went to Brett and told him that he couldn't afford his new contract and that he should try to see if he could still get his deal with Turner instead. And Brett did just that, which initiated Brett's leaving the WWF. Now yet again, I stress, that was all documented. Alright, so just follow the logic here. Brett showed Vince loyalty by taking less money in order to stay with the WWF. Vince came up with the idea to offer Brett a new contract to show his appreciation, but takes it back right away. Then Vince tells him to go to WCW, and when he does so, Vince decides to screw him over. That sounds like a pretty poor way to repay the man, if you ask me. And furthermore, when it comes to losing in Canada, a lot of people point out that Brett 
is from Calgary and losing in Montreal is like someone from California refusing to lose in Florida. To that I say, no it's not. Let's not pretend like Canada is just another state. Especially at the time, WWF was much less international than it is now. Shows in Canada were few and far between. And it's rare enough that going over there is still special, even now. I mean, the British Bulldog may not be from London, but when SummerSlam was at Wembley, it's still understandable that Davy Boy wanted to win there. And even still, once again, it's been documented that Brett offered to drop the title to Shawn Michaels the night after Survivor Series on Raw, which is what Brett actually thought the plan was. And that Raw was still in Canada. So Brett didn't have this unwavering aversion to giving the belt to Shawn Michaels in Canada like many people claim. It's just not true. Another common argument is that Vince had no choice. He couldn't risk Brett bringing the title on WCW TV. Okay, going back to Brett's contract, he was doing Vince a favor by allowing WWF to back out. And since they were backing out, Brett's leaving wasn't an official thing, so why did Vince choose Survivor Series? Why not tell him to leave right away or tell him to leave the week after Survivor Series? Why choose the pay-per-view that just happened to be in Brett's home country? Also, if it was that much of a concern, why not have him drop the belt earlier? Why wait till the last minute? Furthermore, Vince McMahon's doubts about being able to afford Brett began in June, so why did he put the title on Brett in August? McMahon shouldn't have given him the belt in the first place if he was so worried about that. Oh, and also, going back to the night of the screw job itself, Vince was ringside for the match. He could have just physically taken the belt while the match was happening and taken it backstage. No screw job needed. Vince had plenty of options, so I don't buy him having no choice at all. And also, even if Brett wanted to show up in WCW with the title, so what? Some people incorrectly assume that this would have ruined the WWF, but the truth is, evidence shows the opposite. Yes, Ric Flair took the NWA title on WWF TV, but following that, WCW ended up taking the top spot in the rings for the first time just a few years after that. Alondra Blaze threw the WWF women's title in the garbage on WCW TV, and then WWF wound up reaching new heights of success just a few years later. And Ultimo Dragon had the WWF Light Heavyweight Championship on WCW around that time too. So it doesn't really seem that having your belt on rival TV is all that detrimental. Also, Eric Bischoff stated that his conversations with Brett never included him bringing the WWF title over with him. Brett even stated that he would never do that in the first place. And most importantly, Bischoff stated that even if he wanted to, he couldn't do it. After the Alundra Blaze incident, WCW's legal team began tightening their reins on Bischoff. They told him that if anything like that ever happened again, Vince McMahon could sue them for a lot of money and he would win. WCW's legal department would not allow Bischoff to do it because it's just not worth the risk, and if he did so, it most likely would have led to Bischoff's termination with the company. All in all, Brett has always shown to be a stand-up guy, so if he said he wasn't going to bring the belt to WCW, you could probably trust him not to. And even if he did want to, WCW's legal team wouldn't allow him to do it. And even if they did, history has shown that it doesn't seem to be a problem. And even if it was, Vince McMahon had plenty of opportunities to remedy the situation situation without the screw job. And another reason people say that he should have just lost was because he should put over the next guy on his way out and he should go out on his back because that's old school. Well, I already did another video with a whole list of old school wrestlers that didn't go out on their backs, some of which claim to be big proponents of going out losing. So I don't put a whole lot of stock into this philosophy. And also, if that were the case, well, Austin was the next guy, it wasn't Shawn Michaels. And also, there are those who say that Brett's squeaky clean persona didn't belong in the Attitude Era and therefore the screw job was justified. Yet again, some people argue that Bret Hart was a big part of creating the Attitude Era, depending of course on when you think the Attitude Era began. And even if you think it started later, it's hard to deny that Austin's feud with Bret wasn't still a highly influential part of those upcoming years in the WWF. And furthermore, Bret's Heel in America facing Canada gimmick was working. It was new and changed the hitman for the Attitude Era, much in the same way that Hogan's heel turn reimagined the Hulkster for the new direction of WCW at the time. And even if Bret didn't belong there, he was already leaving. Screwing him over wasn't necessary. Next, people will say that the entire industry agrees with Vince McMahon's choice to screw Bret. Well, that's definitely not so. Yes, there are some people who think that, but there are wrestlers like the British Bulldog and the Anvil who quit the WWF and went right to WCW along with Bret. Mick Foley boycotted by no-showing the following night on Raw and was going to continue to do so if it wasn't for Bret telling Foley that while he does appreciate the sentiment, Foley should go back to work. Also, Rick Rude was so irate that he even quit WWF right then and there and went to WCW. Shawn Michaels himself even stated that after the incident, he would change by himself because everyone in the locker room hated 
him for it, and felt that he couldn't be trusted and that it sent him into a depression. So with the locker room against him, that definitely doesn't sound like the entire industry backing up the screw job now, does it? In the end, I ask, if you were a wrestling promoter and someone turns down more money to stay loyal to you, and then you offer him a long-term contract that you then have to back out of, and he allows you to renege on the contract, is screwing him over justified? Especially considering that the consequences that you fear so much were easily remedied in a number of other ways. In the end, Vince McMahon lied to Brett in order to screw him over. And yes, lying is not as major a crime as murder or anything, but this was still a huge violation of trust. In my opinion, the screw job was completely unnecessary, undeserving, and ultimately immoral. Well, there you have it. That's it. I'm finally done talking about the screw job, and I'm just glad to be done with it. Huh. Oh, well, that is true, but that'll have to wait till another episode. I mean, I can't tackle that. Wait a minute. How did you just trick me into that?